guns for show, knives for a pro. In December of 2010, Defense Minister Peter McKay came here to Lockheed Martin's main production plant in Fort Worth, Texas. After touring the facility, he declared to Canadians that this project would be on budget and on time. To learn more about the program and to make our own assessments, we've come here as well. The guys on the ground are going to be able to sit there and, and, and see almost exactly what we're seeing in the cockpit. Wow. It's we were given a private tour of the latest F-35 to come off the assembly line. This is a conventional takeoff and landing variant, the same model Canada intends to buy. We had uh, chasing out at Edwards with uh, two tanked F-16s. The chief test pilot for the Lightning II, Bill Gigliotti, provided us with the ultimate insider's guide to the performance and tactical capabilities of the aircraft. When you look at the aircraft, it was designed from the, really, it was designed from those tires up to be a stealthy airplane. So the, the weapon bay doors, the, every, every part of this airplane was designed around denying the threat's ability to detect you with radar. If you deny that ability of early detection, then you in time now have the ability to be offensive. And that's what this airplane allows you to do. Now, how does it compare in terms of the amount of payload it's allowed to carry <laughs> compared to other aircraft? Well, we exceed them. Okay. I mean, right now, the F, this F-35 with its full internal fuel load carries the same fuel load as an F-18 with three tanks. We carry it internally. Plus, we load stores internally. We can carry 2,000 pound bombs inside, one on each side, plus an AMRAAM. Allows us with an air-to-air -air and air-to-ground capability with all that internal fuel, which allows range and endurance, which allows us persistence over the battlefield. A big problem with our ground forces because this aircraft is going to operate in very close concert with ground forces. During the second, third, fourth day of the war, when we're no longer need to count on those that LO signature, we can load the aircraft up with up to 18,000 pounds of external stores without having to put tanks on it. When we put tanks on an on an aircraft, we take up a weapon station. We don't have to do that on this jet. And, they're, you know, they're just and he says the plane offers Air Force generals a strategic offensive edge. It's designed for the, 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 the generals uh, who are going to fight wars. They want the biggest tool. They want to bring out the hammer and say, boom, I'm going to knock that threat out right now. Now, in your experience, having flown all sorts of different aircraft, what is it that this aircraft can provide that no other aircraft can? Well, first off, stealth. Um, when we, we build an aircraft from, from stealth, we have to design it from the ground floor up, and we did that with this aircraft. Um, this aircraft embodies all the best of the legacy tile or older fighters that I've had the opportunity to fly. Um, it, en it encompasses the best of the weapon systems from, from how they operate and how we, we bring that information to the pilot and display it to the best of how those airplanes flew or still fly. And we've accompanied them and wrapped them in a stealthy structure like the F-35 has. So you take all the best of that way those airplanes fly, both in performance and handling qualities, which is the way we pilots think of how well they perform and handle to our inputs. And we wrap that in a stealthy design like the F-35, and you make a threshold difference in what you used to have to what the F-35 brings you in a fifth-gen fighter. And what about its handling capabilities? Well, the F like I said, this aircraft here, the F-35, handles as good or better than any legacy fighter. It, from, a, from a landing standpoint, the aircraft is the easiest aircraft I've ever seen to land. Um, from the airway, it rolls, it rolls like an F-16, which is a phenomenal and quick and responsive, agile fighter. For layperson's audience, I mean, what does this stealth capability allow this fighter to do um, in terms of tactical deployment? I mean, what, what is it that makes it an edge that people would want to have? We have a sanctuary that we never had before. And that sanctuary is the inability for them to detect us in the time to react to the aircraft. And in that time, we buy ourselves the opportunity to employ our weapon system, which is far beyond where the legacy aircraft are. So not only can they not detect us, but we're employing weapons well before we were previously because of the weapon system we have on the airplane. It's sort of like a fighter going into a, into a ring and fighting an opponent with one hand tied behind his back and oh, by the way, now we're going to put a blindfold on them. So they can't see and they can't hit you. We're just taking sucker punches, so to speak. And it's unfair and we like it that way. During our visit, officials also stressed the wealth of opportunities available to Canadian industry. One example being that components of the tail fin assembly are being produced by a Canadian company. The backbone of this mile-long assembly line is state-of-the-art hydraulic hoists, which are also made in Canada. Aircraft of all three variants are already coming off the line here, but it will be some time before the company reaches its target 
of producing one F-35 per day. We may succeed as a company, but this airplane helps our country succeed. And they say the benefits for Canadian industry are only just beginning. Today we have about $320 million in contracts, active contracts, on the program several years before Canada has to actually procure the airplane. When you extend those contracts over the life of the production program and you allow other opportunities that Canada will have to bid on additional work, the, the projected value of that is somewhere on the order of about $12 billion. That far exceeds the acquisition price of the airplanes. Back in Canada, industrial benefits have been showcased as one of the major advantages Canada gains from being inside the Joint Strike Fighter program. We know this is the best deal long term over the next 40 years. It's a long term deal for the Canadian uh, taxpayer. And we know especially it's the best deal because we hear it from everybody in the Canadian aerospace industry. Twelve billion dollars of potential benefits for this country. We will take one series of questions and... In the fall of 2010, the CEOs of Canada's largest aerospace companies participated in a joint media event to voice their support for the purchase of the F-35. As chairman of the aerospace industries of Canada, I'm proud to be here today to support the acquisition of new jet fighters for our Canadian forces. In addition to the tremendous benefits that will come with the purchase of 65 aircraft, this decision represents an even greater opportunity for Canadian industry to have access to work on thousands of planes. Canada is going to see long-term benefits that come with the economies of scale that a program this size delivers, and even greater opportunities based on this timely government decision because of the technology transfers that that facilitates. Determining which aircraft you're going to buy on the basis of what industry is telling you in your own country, what the CEOs want, is always the absolute worst reason to buy something. And that's where big mistakes always occur when you try to buy military equipment based on industrial or commercial kind of uh, criteria. The major reason you buy something is because it meets the needs of the military. So I would never ever agree that because something benefits this company or that company, we should buy it. That is totally putting things totally backwards. You buy it because it's the best one. Now, having said that, you know, in terms of industrial regional benefits, we're doing dramatically worse through this than we would through a competition. Canada has done very well. We've doubled our money um, on uh, how much has been invested to date and so Canadian manufacturers have found this to be a very successful process so far for them. Senator Colin Kenny, former chair of the Senate Defense Committee, contrary to his own Liberal Party's position, supports the government's choice of the F-35, especially as it pertains to the program's industrial benefits. Now what we have a chance at getting is a world product mandate for a portion of the aircraft. Maybe it's the wings, maybe it's the tail structure. I mean, I don't know what portions we're going to bid for, uh, but normally what we get back is a 100% offset on a purchase. But it's not necessarily anything to do with the aircraft that we're buying. Uh, it's what we'd normally get back is a hundred percent of the price that we paid for the aircraft but it could just as easily be in in garbage can lids or in uh, um, wheel frames or all sorts of things that have absolutely nothing to do with aerospace work and what I like about this is however many are sold worldwide we will have a chance to bid for building our piece of the plane for all of them and the work will be aerospace. So I think that Canada, <clears throat> that's, what it, that's what it appealed to me most, and I think Canada gets a special benefit that way, rather than the usual offset arrangement that we see. What Lockheed has done is very much like a Ponzi scheme. They've run around to the, uh, um, the eight uh, foreign purchasers, making these promises of future deals that'll aid your aerospace industry. And um, just like in a Ponzi scheme, uh, there's going to be some winners and this, there's going to be some losers. And Canada doesn't know 
uh, which it's going to be, you're up against the Israeli aerospace industry, you're up against European aerospace industry. Uh, good luck. We'll see what comes at the other end. All of the countries that are involved in Joint Strike Fighter have been given a part of the work share. So you do really wonder, um, actually, how effective that's going to be. Across the Atlantic, Britain's commitment to the Joint Strike Fighter program dwarfs that of Canada. Internationally respected defense analyst Paul Beaver explains. Well, the United Kingdom's romance uh, with the Joint Strike Fighter began about 10 years ago. The United Kingdom wanted to become a tier one partner uh, with America, which meant it invested over two billion pounds sterling uh, in the development of the Joint Strike Fighter, and companies like BAE Systems and Rolls-Royce would benefit from orders that were placed uh, around the world. Britain's parliament had originally indicated it would purchase 140 F-35 fighters to be deployed on two new aircraft carriers. But after a major strategic defense review, Britain has decided it can only afford to operate one aircraft carrier. We will end up having one carrier at sea at one time. The other carrier will be laid up and, and then there will be a, um, a, a shuffle across. This has meant that both the, the Joint Strike Fighter's total number um, in the inventory will be reduced to something like between 56 and 65, depending on what we can afford. And the United Kingdom actually doesn't know what it can afford because it doesn't know what the price is going to be yet. And the fewer planes Britain orders, the higher the cost per plane for all the other JSF partner nations. Well, I think the price of Joint Strike Fighter, as countries tend to, to shrink their orders, and remembering that, that people have not fully signed up to Joint Strike Fighter, uh, I think it will put the price up. And the problem is we don't actually know what that price is now, so we've no idea what it could be in the future. The cost per aircraft is without doubt the most politically sensitive element of the F-35 procurement. The original objective of the Joint Strike Fighter program was to keep the cost per plane to $50 million. But by the time the Canadian government announced its decision to purchase the F-35 in July 2010, the estimated cost was $75 million. In March 2011, the U.S. Government Accountability Office upped the estimate to between $110 and $115 million. In that same month, the Parliamentary Budget Officer dropped his own bombshell with an estimate of between $148 and $163 million per plane. D&D is talking about an acquisition cost right now, something in this roughly $70 million per plane. Whereas when we look at the unit cost for these planes between 2016 and 2022, and again based on methodologies and assumptions that are highlighted, we're, we think that you know, the cost could be in the $148, $49 million range, um, which is obviously a lot higher, more than you know, twice as high as what um, the, the, you know, the Canadian government is saying. Because the government did not release the detailed financial data behind their own costing formula, Page had to rely on historical trends of combat aircraft costs to arrive at his estimate. 